Good morning from California. I'm Will Chu. I'm the faculty director of StorageX Initiative and a professor of material science and engineering at Stanford University. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, StorageX Symposium. So today we have a focused discussion on a topic that received a lot of attention and is receiving a lot of attention, which is solid state batteries. And I'm very delighted to be hosting two of my colleagues from MIT to speak about the many aspects of material design, manufacturing, and also the availability of raw materials for solid state battery technologies. Our first speaker is Professor Jennifer Rook, whom I will introduce just in a moment. And our second speaker is Professor Alsa Elevetti as I mentioned, both from MIT. So I am extremely delighted to be joined by my longtime friend and colleague, Jennifer Root. Welcome, Jennifer. As you reminded me, we have known each other for a very long time, uh, for nearly 20 years. And uh, I just wanna say Jen is a true delight to be with in all settings, professional and otherwise. And she is, an innovator uh, in the area of ceramics material. She has worked on a lot of different things. Um, when I first met her, she was working on thin film fill cells. Then every few years she would reinvent her cells. Then she was working on oxide memory devices, memristors. And more recently she has got into energy storage. And the common theme is, is really ceramics, whether it's nano or macro, whether it's thin film or bulk. She's really a master of manipulating ceramics at all levels. And today we're really delighted to have her give an in-depth talk on solid state batteries with a focus on synthesis and manufacturing for something that will have to attack a problem of enormous scale. So Jennifer, I'm really delighted to be hosting today. Thank you for joining us. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction, Will. And also, I would like to thank Yi and Stanford for inviting me here today. And I'm really pleased to be virtually in sunny California today, thanks to Zoom. So here's the title of my talk. Um, today, I will speak about design and manufacture of solid state batteries to its low cost. So this when we think about the world, actually, what motivates me most in thinking about new ceramics and what they can do actually in energy storage is to think about what is the best way to have cheap and accessible energy storage for a really wide section of the country and um, of the countries and also actually in the world. So what I really like here is to show um, a map where we can actually see the climate change projection for 2017. And what we can see here on this map is that colored in red, you can see the regions that are actually most prone to be affected by climate change. So when we analyze this map really carefully, then we can see that actually, especially in South America and in Africa and also in Asia, there will be a huge effect until 2070 of climate change. And in this little black dots, and I think that's quite impressive, you can see 67 cities that will have a new and unprecedented climate, like it's nowhere existing actually right now on Earth. And I think this should ring the bell really hard because very often um, these are places in the world um, where, let's say, the human development index, um, if we look, for instance, in South America and in some places also in Africa, is lowered compared to the US. And therefore, I think as um, scientists and actually as technologists, we should do everything we can and spend every minute that we have to think about what can I contribute um, to actually invent um, or find other solutions to have actually cheap, accessible energy storage. And I think having, for instance, 67 cities with a climate like nowhere else on Earth um, right now in 2070 is really um, challenging because this has several implications on the human well-being. So there could be, for instance, rays of new diseases. And also, um, if we think about it, 
then there is actually, when we look at the worldwide um, climate change projections, um, a very high effect by how many energy will be needed until 2050, 2070 due to that effect. For instance, when we look into India, um, we will have actually an uprise, um, which is almost like um, a five times tall on um, the billions of kilowatt hours that will be needed actually to cool down the country um, due to the changes actually that are mitigated by climate change. So climate change is real. And I think we should really um, take care about that and uh, invent actually new solutions. So um, let me go to the next slide. Um, how do I jump actually from climate change to batteries? Well, that is quite easy. I think batteries are a very good way um, to store our 170,000 of terawatts um, solar income energy that we have for free into electricity and make it readily accessible and available in terms of infrastructure and mobility. So on the left side, I have um, a little diagram here where you can actually see a classic um, classic um, battery in the middle where you have actually the liquid electrolyte and a power separator that separates actually here the graphite anode and also the cathode um, composite that you have over there and with which you can actually store like in your conventional batteries um, of your of your electric vehicle or for instance of an electronic energy by shuffling lithium back and forth um, between the electrodes. Now, if we think about solid state batteries, what is meant here by solid is that we kick out actually this polymer separator and we bring in a ceramic material which encapsulates the lithium and it's just simply fast enough to transfer actually later the lithium between the cathode and an anode. Why this is actually so relevant is that this is the door opener to two main features um, for future battery technology. First, we can integrate pure lithium as an anode material because many of the solid state battery electrolytes are stable against lithium. And this will increase actually later um, the storage density that you have and the overall energy density of the battery um, by a factor um, yeah, going up to 3,600 um, amps per um, in capacity. And also if we think about the cathodes, and this is quite interesting because many of the solid electrolytes may be also a door opener to bring in much more um, high voltage cathode materials that conventionally uh, may not all be stable in classic um, porous separator polymer um, electrolyte arrangements of the batteries. So by going to solid state, this may be the next batteries that will allow us to um, profit on higher volumetric and gravimetric energies. So what does that mean for materials? So on the right side, um, you can see in a renewed diagram where you have on the y-axis the log of conductivity for the lithium and on the x-axis you have the reciprocal temperature. Now, if we look into that, then there is two major classes that compete with today's polymer separators that you find in the classic lithium ion battery. There's the oxide classes, where you can find materials like so-called lithium garnets, and there is the sulfide classes, um, where you can find materials like LGPS and others. They have actually quite high conductivity that are within one order of magnitude comparable to today's liquid electrolyte porous um, separators. Um, however, they are now in a solid state form. Now, what is, there's a huge discussion right now in the field among tech and also actually in science, uh, what will come first, oxide to sulfide. I just wanna declare here right away that I will not comment on that in my talk. However, I wanna highlight here some substantial differences. So in sulfide cells, um, if we look in a recent analysis um, by my colleague Jürgen Janik, then there is actually already a quite high advancement of cells that have been produced. There's a high activity actually in the field. And um, this has actually come already quite far along in having actually some first um, cell prototypes and different geometries tested. And the reason for that is quite simple. It is that actually sulfide-based electrolytes um, in terms of processing, a low temperature processing that you can fabricate actually quite easily. These are razor soft materials. And that's actually quite advantageous um, for that perk. Where it's a little bit challenging with sulfides is that you need very high pressure um, on the cells to operate them um, in later um, cell geometries. Now, when we look in the oxide-based materials, um, they're quite interesting because they can operate with pure lithium, which is a bit of a challenge for the sulfide-based cells. And also because they have been manufactured open, often at high temperatures and high pressures, um, they need less pressure actually during operation. When we look in this analysis, overall oxide-based um, batteries, um, solid state batteries, 
are overall, and that's one thing to consider, less advanced in various cell geometries and architectures that have been manufactured. So much more needs to happen, but I ascribe that to a strong tie that is existing actually to what is possible in terms of ceramic manufacturing as this operates um, in, in the manufacture at higher temperature. Now, um, of course, in Corona, we were a little bit bored with the team. So what we have recently done is uh, we wrote, I think, the longest paper we ever wrote so far, um, comparing oxide and sulfide-based materials. And I just want to highlight here two, three key messages of this rather complicated plot, so where you can compare transport, electrochemical stability window, and several mechanics, and also the thermal um, process window of different like uh, lithium oxide compositions for electrolytes versus sulfide compositions. So why I personally think that um, lithium oxide materials are very interested and very in say of um, like garnets is that this is, I think, a great way to bring in pure lithium into batteries. However, what we also see, and that is what my talk will be about, um, is that we have to bring down the process temperatures from traditionally like above 1000 degrees Celsius to much lower as this significantly scales later with costs. And this is actually where um, the motivation goes for the next slide. Um, so when you do a little bit of the cost analysis, then um, we quickly realize that to meet the Department of Energy, uh, suggestion to have about 350 watt hour per kilogram of storage for a solid state battery system. This would translate to about $100 per kilowatt hour. Now, in terms of ceramics, what it means is the following. So when one does a quick math and one translates what it means in materials and processing, then one has about $30 per kilogram for processing and the materials of a solid state battery, which includes the anode electrolyte and cathode. And um, if one looks, for instance, in other technologies that are available to do ceramic processing that are far more established, like solid oxide fuses, and assumes similar processes to make, for instance, solid state batteries in the future, like tape casting or other techniques, then this all breaks down to a cost bracket of about 8.5 to $12.5 um, per square meter on a cell pack level um, of total cost that the solid state battery would cost right now. However, this has not been optimized, and that's very important to understand. So 75% of these costs are really related later to the manufacturer. So it's not the raw materials if that goes into um, massive production. It's mostly really the processing itself of the lithium um, oxide-based solid state battery materials. And this has to come significantly down to about $4 per square meter on a pack level to be competitive with current lithium ion batteries. If you would reach that, given the higher energy density, because you can integrate, for instance, lithium, I think there's a very high likelihood that this is going to be the next generation solid state batteries. What I also will say is that not only a full solid state battery is of interest, but also establishing the solid electrolytes for any like hybrid models of batteries, where, for instance, um, a liquid like casolite um, that's just acting here as a separator, and for instance, then um, the dense um, cathode nanode components there as well. So both is very possible. The take home message that I want to give you from this cost analysis, and I think this is really important, is that we have to reduce the costs and understand where they stem from in the manufacture of the ceramic solid state battery electrolyte park. So one thing that is amusing is that when the Department of Energy made the cost projection of about $100 per kilowatt hour for solid state batteries, they assumed a 20 micron thick electrolyte. However, um, I think up to this talk, there is not many opportunities uh, or even manufacturer options to make that. And I hope to convince you by the end of the talk that there is some new options to do so. Now, um, what I also want to show here is that in the battery design, the smaller you can later go with a solid state battery electrolyte and the more room you give to the cathode and the anode part, the better it is for the battery because you will have an overall higher energy storage. What I've done here in a little exercise with my team is to look into various solid state battery electrolyte chemistries. So there is Lipon, which is currently a material that is uh, the one that is cycled up to 10,000 cycles and the longest in solid state battery. It's also one of the oldest known ones or established ones. And there's many other chemistries. And what this plot actually shows is that to transfer a high temperature ceramic made above 1,000 degrees Celsius from a thick millimeter type 
palette actually into a thin film structure or anything that is looking like a film that's very thin to give more room to the cathode and the anode, it takes on average 10 to 15 years. So it takes about 10 years for developing a new chemistry of a solid state battery electrolyte. And then you have to add actually another 10 to 15 to make it very small, thin, and ideally at a low temperature. So this is actually not so good. So I showed you in the beginning um, that we have to mitigate climate change. So we have to rag it up here and become actually much faster. Um, so we have to find actually ways to beat that and offer better manufacture. Now, what I want to show you actually here in this talk, and um, I have scheduled the talks along different challenges that I see. So I want to talk, and the first challenge that I outline here, is it possible to take actually some of these known chemistries normally made at pellets or tapes and bring it down to thin films and keep actually the same lithium conduction properties for solid state battery electrolytes? Then in the second challenge, I will talk about how to make that at low cost with some new manufacturer options in ceramics. And then I will talk um, about some other um, topics. So another challenge is how to make good interfaces and want to show you here some new material classes on polyamorphous garnets. And finally, I will talk about how to make um, very reduced um, resistances and interface um, area specific resistances at the cathode electrolyte interface. So let's go to the first one. How do we make very thin solid state battery electrolytes um, to give more room to the electrodes in the overall battery design? So what you can see here is actually a very classic Arrhenius diagram like we have seen before. And there has been many publications that look in the Arrhenius diagram assessing different oxide-based lithium solid state battery electrolytes in their conductivity and over temperature. Now then the other diagram that is looked at is the electrochemical stability window. And among the different options of materials, we can see here that the composition of lithium gallium lanthanum zirconium oxide, the so-called lithium garnets, are um, actually quite okay -ish. in terms of conductivity. They have about one millisiemens per centimeter at room temperature. But what is really cool about them is that they are actually stable um, up to very low voltages. So they can directly operate with lithium without any use or need um, of a protective layer. Now, one plot that you haven't seen so far in literature, unless you open up this publication and that we allowed ourselves with our team to postulate that it will become quite important, is to look at what is the potential to make now a thin film out of these chemistries and what is the thermal processing budget to do so. So what we can see on the left side, if you do a classic synthesis, um, like taking powders of a material chemistry for the solid state battery electrolyte, you densify that you, by applying pressure and then go into high temperatures, you need actually above 1000 degrees Celsius to get this cubic high conductive lithium garnet phase, which gives severe limitations in bringing cobalt reduced cathodes in because simply by co-sintering and phase nature, many of them like LFP or NMC are less stable. One really cool way to mitigate that is actually to reduce the thermal processing window of the solid state battery electrolyte and looking also into making this component smaller in thickness. So there's meanwhile several options to make thin films of these components. I just want to highlight here the blue, which is the lithium garnet. You can either make it as a cubic or amorphous face. And by doing so, you can access the whole range below 900, which gives you now opportunities to bring in cobalt reduced cathodes as well, and also keeping a very small size factor. So I mentioned in the beginning that it takes about 10 to 15 years to transfer for a whole field on this chemistry from a pellet tape classic processing into something very small and thin. Now I want to show you here where the challenge is in doing that and why does it actually take so long. So when we have, for instance, a chemistry like the lithium garnets, then one of the most challenging things that is very particular to the ceramics is to keep the lithium actually all in the structure. So when you do classic powder processing and then actually sintering, you can normally overlysiate your powder. And then you hope that actually the whole lithium will stay in the structure. And then when you anneal and sinter it, um, if you have put in enough, it will be enough to phase stabilize by the increased lithium content, the high cubic um, conducting phase. However, if you take, for instance, a pre-sinted pellet, even if you overlysiate that, and you can only do that to a certain limit, and you ablate later um, with a laser, for instance, the pellet to make a thin film, so you can ablate that down by techniques like pulse laser deposition, then you will quickly see that the field was struggling for almost 10 years because they lost most of the lithium and they never made it to fully access the fast conducting cubic, um, cubic structure and chemistry of that film. 
So one of the key home message here is actually to go very thin. You have to be very, very vigilant in assessing that you have actually a very high lithium conductivity by keeping the lithium in check and in the structure. And you can't often do that by just over lithiating the target because at high energy, you use, lose most of the material. So we thought about that and we came up with a little trick um, that's a work going back to Rachel Frenninger, Michal Stolzig and my um, group. And what we thought about is, well, can we use like two targets? We make a second one, which is lithium nitride and which is very close to um, the wavelengths and band gap actually of our laser zeta blades. So it allows us a very fast transfer of lithium nitride um, on our substrate. And we could start to form a multi-layer where every 30 nanometer, you have either lithium garnet a bit under lithiated or lithium nitride. And we start to build that out um, like a consistent little skyscraper, but as a thin film. So if you do that and you later post the it, you can decompose the lithium nitride of the sublayers, but the lithium then sticks in the film and starts to lithiate and populate the lithium garnet phase that you have. And by doing so, you can suddenly access the cubic high conducting phase. So this trick is described here on the side. So you can see here lithium nitride and the other target. We go here in a multi-layer deposition. And after annealing at only 650 degrees C, we get actually here a fully lithiated garnet film. Now, if we look into that a bit further, so this is how that looks like. That's a substrate. And you can see here the cross section and a scanning electron microscope of such a multi layer that we deposit. So the whole thing has only 500 nanometers. You have to imagine before things were um, manufactured on a pallet and tape level, which is surely be beyond 60 to 100 microns more millimeter level. So this is a significant decrease of the electrolyte. And you can see here by contrast change that everywhere where the shape goes from dark to to light contrast, you have actually here the different constituent phase of isolithium nitrogen garnet. Now going up to 650 in an anneal, the magic happens. And actually the lithium nitride decomposes in a chemical reaction and we can later see one um, phase contrast, which indicates that we have now the full phase of the lithium garnet. And in the analysis by Tov Sims, we can later see that we have a quite good decomposition and we really have the lithiated um, lithium garnet constituents. Also everywhere we originally had a lithium garnet monolayer, we can still see the aluminum dopant very well as a signature. So one can track how the film was really made here. Now, how does that affect actually later the face? Um, so long story short, we have here a Raman diagram. Raman spectroscopy is really good to probe, for instance, the near order lithium oxygen vibrations, which are very light, normally hard to track in an X-ray diffraction. And the main signature I want to draw your attention to is actually is this orange line at about 660 degrees C. So when one compares that to a reference, that's exactly the cubic lithium garnet phase. And what's very exciting is that by this new process, we brought down um, typical processing from 1050 to 660 degrees C, and we brought down a structure from 100 micron to about 500 nanometer in thickness as a solid state battery electrolyte. So what it demonstrates is it is very well possible to make these structures very thin and also at low temperature, but you have to control the lithium stoichiometry very well. Now, how does that affect um, the overall lithium conductivity? You can see here on the left side, um, the conductivity in the Renius diagram. And we can see here that the films process through that route after decomposition of the multi-layer to a full film. Um, we can see that they have actually quite high conductivities above, uh, about 10 over minus five Siemens per centimeter at room temperature. And if you would do it in the traditional way, you would just lose most of the lithium, you're under lithiated and you simply don't have a fast conducting film. So this just demonstrates um, a way to do it. Now, what I want to show you is actually in a summary and comparison on this part of the work um, is actually where we stand. So you can see here the room temperature lithium conductivity of this electrolyte over temperature. And the first really cool part is that it is um, close or actually even um, yeah, very competitive um, to LiPon. So it's another alternative thin film structure that can be manufactured, but is now a lithium garnet structure. And what's also exciting is that you can see here the temperature reduction in manufacture from above 1000 to around 650, um, but being now also in a thin film uh, structure overall. And after our publication in 2019, I was thrilled to see that there has been several follow-up groups. So there's, for instance, Jordi um, from Emperor, who, for instance, demonstrated also um, even using a similar approach in sputtering, uh, also higher conduction. So this is really translatable to several labs um, all over the world right now as a technique.
So after this work, we said, well, this is nice, but actually it's not good enough, right? So past laser deposition is a vacuum technique. So how is that going to help the planet? Uh, because it's just too expensive in manufacturing. So it demonstrates we can be very thin, but it's not good enough um, to support, I, I think, overall to have actually cheap energy storage solutions. And that motivated actually a part of our next work that I'm very excited about um, to share. So how can we make now thin ceramic and robust electrolytes at low manufacturing costs? So I wanted to just highlight real quick here where industry is and where research is. So currently when I analyze the field and what they are doing in ceramic manufacturing that we just made this plot with the team, um, with my colleague Moran Balaish and um, many other colleagues in the team. So when we look for instance, first of all, the good news is that most of the chemistries you can process them already in either thin film structures, keeping the situation in check or actually with tapes or pallets as ceramics. However, what is a bit of a challenge is that 95% of the published research, if I just analyze that for lithium garnet, is mostly, mostly done on pellets. And that has to do often with the history of a research lab um, being very knowledgeable and trained in making ceramic pellets by densification of powders and then going up into very high center temperatures. However, none of these pellets will ever make it into any battery product for cars or EV, simply because um, that is not the way to manufacture something later on large scale and for cheap cost. What has been very exciting is there is um, the group of um, Eric Waxman, and I think there has been also other great contributions by Sakamoto and many others, um, demonstrating that one can also make tapes out of these materials, which is already much better because that's something ceramic industry knows how to process. Um, and these tapes are normally like more on the scale of like 100 microns and above um, to be robust. However, they are very far away on where a classic polymer separator of my phone here um, is in the battery. So in this battery here, we have actually a polymer separator that is 10 to 20 microns thick. So what can we do to actually come in that space? So if we look on the other hand on thin films, that's far too thin. It's not robust enough. It's like below one micron. And also in all the vacuum techniques, that's simply too expensive uh, for, for low cost manufacturing. So we have to be in this case, um, in this space here, close to a polymer separator. And I do believe that I can say that I don't know any product right now that is in that space, but being a ceramic. So how can we replace a 20 micron polymer separator, but with a ceramic? I think that's uh, the really important question here. And it's important as this will contribute um, to reduce the overall costs of the system. Well, so um, I wanna show you another analysis um, that I just made um, very recently. And I want to show you what the EV world needs here in terms of manufacturing and what actually battery electronics need. So we have here the electrolyte thickness on the left side of the y-axis, and you have here a manufacturable solid state or polymer electrolyte area for battery design. So when we think about prismatic batteries later going in production or also advanced systems like the blade battery cell to packs um, that are currently discussed, we need to be able later to code about 30 to 10 square centimeters like full and dense and defect free with a ceramic. So this is really challenging. In case of going later into the space of electronics, um, this is far more reduced. So the separator size here would only be three by five um, square centimeters. And these are values that are currently used in industry at check with some contacts. And I wanna demonstrate you now here what the ceramic industry can do. So I will paste that right now in the same plot. So if I paste it here, then for, we can take an example by thinking about what is the product that can be made as a ceramic separator by tapes um, in the industry that is the widest area size. And that would be alumina. And alumina, for instance, you can buy right now in a size of 20 by 20 square centimeters. So it would be within the range of what electric vehicles later need for a battery as a ceramic coating. And that has been about 40 years of development of an industry. However, when we look into tapes for lithium garnets, then the maximum size that is currently developed and that is crack free and dense um, that you can find by some ceramic manufacturers that are about to come out with products or just very recently is on the size of five by five square centimeter. Scaling this up to the size needed here for EV will be a challenge because unlike alumina, this wiggles much more in making the tape. And also there is much more changes in, in much more challenges in establishing the face in it. So it's far more complicated and not 
an equivalent transfer to just go from a tape of five by five square centimeter to 20 by 20 square centimeter. And I think there will be a lot of development by industry and researchers needed to make it there. I am very hopeful for that, but I think it's gonna be challenging. On the other hand, if you look, for instance, in atomic layer deposition, a thin film technique, you would drop in the thickness, so you would need a support structure, but you could think about something light. And that could be very interesting, I think, for the uh, electronic space. However, it will be very challenging just by area codable to just upscale that to an EV. So we thought about that very heavily with the team and thought about, okay, how can we invent a new ceramic tax that will allow us to be there where cell guard polymer separator is, but with a ceramic that has about 10 to 20 micron and, and that's really important here, has the option to later upscale far more easily, going away from classic tapes and doing what actually ceramicists are trained to do the best, ditch the centering at all to avoid it to really reduce the manufacture cost. So here's actually a new technique that I want to show you that you can't find in a classic ceramic textbook, which we call sequential deposition synthesis. The idea is here that we want to make films that are now about 10 micron in thickness, but we want to do that without any sintering, and we want to do that with a complicated chemistry like lithium garnets, and find a protocol to avoid sintering, so we want to do the whole manufacture in a cheap, low-cost budget manufacturing way, um, staying at temperatures below 600 degrees Celsius. So there are several techniques like pyrolysis, known in ceramic or saw gel or dip coating, where you can have a precursor and how it normally goes is you have some metal source default in some high boiling point organic, you bring it to a spray gun or, or any other way you want to coat, you create some droplets and you let it rain on a heated substrate. And if you hit it right by chemistry, you can have a transfer of the metal salt into the metal oxide and can invent something that is like a four or five cation uh, component oxide. It has never been done for lithium garnet, um, so state battery electrolyte best to my knowledge, or not with high conductivities. Now, the problem is that you can't roll out the boat here normally in ceramic manufacture to be um, above one micron, because the challenge is that the moment you go higher in thickness, you will see actually that you have got drying cracks, and it's very difficult to control the process, because that deposition on the heated substrate, when you transfer the metal salt to the metal oxide, um, you have a lot of like cracks in the transformation because all the metal salts go directly in one step and at one temperature event in the chemical reaction into the metal oxide forming um, later a 4,5 cation lithium garment composition. So it's impossible with classic pyrolysis to make films that are above one micron also very hard or impossible with sodium um, or other wet coating cheap techniques. So we thought about it and we came up with the following trick. One thing that is really cool about lithium, some of the lithium oxide based materials we work with like garnets is that they are also existing in a non lithiated state. So the lithium garnet, if you take all the lithium out of the chemical structure, then you can have a lot of vacancies in it and it can be fully um, stable by being actually existent in the pyrochlor phase. That's normally what you try to avoid when you have lithium loss going to high temperatures and sintering. But we use this trick here that this is possible to be a delisiated structure by itself to our advantage. So what we did is we in invent some new sequential deposition synthesis, so-called SDS precursors that have a two-step chemical de deposition reaction where we define that we let first decompose um, when we spray down actually the precursor on the heated substrate, all the metal cations that are not lithium to form a pyrochlor phase, but we have already the lithium salt in it. And then in a second step going slightly higher in temperature, we decompose the lithium salt, bring that um, into oxide, let it diffuse into the formed pyrochlor backbone. And thereby it allows us suddenly to control the drying much better. So we spread that out over a wider temperature range. And that is a new trick, how to make unique 10 micron um, thick films that I will show you now. So what we can see now in the next slide is actually here a little comparison um, just to previous like ceramic tax. So what the field is currently doing on lithium garnets for tapes, for instance, in industry is they make first a powder, then they have to densify that. Then they go to high temperature and Sinton have grain bound and volume diffusion activated, and then actually get a solid state battery electrolyte um, that's quite dense and thick and it made at very high um, temperatures as un unwanted. Now in this technique here, what's new also compared to classic soil gel is that we spread out the thermal processing window on purpose at a very low temperature. And we define this precursor that we first form the pyrochlor 
lanthanum zirconium uh, aluminum dope structure, but have a lithium salt in it already at deposition. And then in a second step, go in a slightly higher temperature. And then we can actually see that the lithium salt decomposes, lithium starts to diffuse into the preformed pyroclast structure, and then actually starts to form the lithium garnet structure at a quite low temperature. Now we can see actually in the slide how that looks like. Um, so this is also a joint collaboration um, that we had together with Samsung. So I want to give you an honorable mention to Lincoln Myra and uh, Wansok Chang, who have been working with us here and also um, to Yun Tong Ju and actually Zach Hood, um, who have been carrying out the work. So what I'm really excited here to show you is I think the first films that have about two to about 10 micron thickness. So it's now the thickness of a ceramic crack free and dense with about 10 nanometer of grain size. And you can see here the crack free corroding um, overall that are covering actually the whole substrate. And this is now exactly the space you want to be for processing. So it's a low budget process and it's close to where polymer separator is. We can vary the thickness um, going anywhere from one to even up to 10 micron 15 roughly. And the really cool thing is that all was made about 650 degrees Celsius and we have never really classically centered these structures. Now, if we look here on the next slide, I want to disclose a little bit on how the basic fundamentals of this chemical reactions work. So I mentioned before this two-step chemical reaction, and we made here a little like flashlight diagram how to constitute and how to make such precursors to make such a deposition. So in the case of lithium garnets, what you want to do is you always want to choose a higher decomposition temperature for the lithium salt that is pre-mixed in your precursor together with the other metal salts of your pyrochlorons and garnet phase. So that you first form the pyrochlor phase and then actually have the lithium salt already like sit in it and then decompose, control the drying by there and being able to grow very thick. What's kind of interesting is so below here in the lower box, you would see different options for different lanthanum, zirconium and dopin salts you can pick for instance. And you wanna make sure here that they all decompose in one temperature event. So these should be very close in color code that we have. And then you can see here different lithium salt options that you can choose. You want to choose one that is dissolvable in a mix of high boiling point organics, but is slightly higher uh, to go here with our flashlight diagram than um, the preformed pyrochlor that you actually have here um, from the other components. Why I'm be telling that here in this way is that this method is translatable to many other lithium compositions. So you could make lithium cobalt oxide like that, lithium titanate, but also many other options. You just have to readapt and build up a landscape um, for the selection of the right SDS precursor um, to build that up. But this is a door opener to make some very sick films um, being close to polymer separator. Now, um, what I want to also show here is a little bit more about the formation. So now a particular case, I go back um, to my favorite Raman spectroscopy because I love to look really into the near order and what's happening with the lithium and oxygen vibrational modes and also many other oscillate elements. So what's exciting is that in the beginning when we deposit at around 200, 300 degrees C, so we form a razor-like dense film, and in the film, we can show actually in Raman spectroscopy that the lithium salt, which is a lithium nitride, is even trackable in the beginning of the film. So it's an amorphous film of the other metal cations that form. And in it, you have actually already the lithium salt that is trackable by the signal. So it's a composite that you first form. Then you open annealing. We actually start at some point when we go higher in temperature to melt up and decompose, so you can see is a melting and transmission electron microscopy of the lithium salt in the preformed film. And when that happened, you have actually coincidingly as formation of an amorphous phase first for the other cations, then a pyrochlor phase. And then once the lithium starts to diffuse and in those various techniques, which, which you, we probed that, we can actually see that the lithium goes in the structure and then forms from this amorphous slash pyrochlor phase. Uh, later over into the cubic lithium garnet phase. But the cool thing is that's now not made with any expensive vacuum method. So it's a really low tech, um, cheap way to process that. And we get at a very low temperature, these 10 micron films uh, with the right lithium garnet uh, cubic fast conducting phase. When you would go to very high temperatures, then we see also in the transmission electron microscopy, the change from this amorphous and then actually molten off lithium salt and then, then uh, lithiated structure into actually forming a grain grain boundary. So that's what you see here by the shade um, differentiation, where you can see the progressing grain rows into the films. And um, 
just to show you, and I want to highlight here also some work um, of um, Jesse Hinrischer in my group and also where Andrea Murano is also a big part of, is actually that this cannot only be used later to be coded on dense substrate, but you can also use, for instance, Paris substrate. So I have here, for instance, like a little glass fiber that I just hold here in the camera, and you can use it actually here to even coat glass fibers um, dense and crap free, uh, more or less, um, in, in, in really gaining like some first coatings because the capillary forces of the droplets coming down will actually later like um, lead to a densification of the film. So I think this is some very interesting new ways um, to process um, that, that go beyond the classic textbook of ceramics. The films do have connectivities that are close to other films made on the lower end, like 500 nanometers, like the past laser deposition film, but we ditched here really um, the vacuum methods and, uh, and the expensive processing. Now, um, what I will show here is just a little nutshell of what that means. So compared to traditional processing, we show here that we are close to a circuit separator, but for ceramic, the way to do that is to increase the drying budget and stretch that out at lower temperature. That's where you wanna be um, with your chemistry and defining the chemical reaction of your SDS precursor. Why is that relevant? Well. If we can process now at 600, 650, you can bring in LFP uh, or other like structures like NMC or an NCA as cathodes that are normally not stable um, in classic sintering when you have to go to very high temperatures. So if you're here in that space, it's very hard to bring that in, but now we have an opportunity to bring that actually together. Um, and I think this is very relevant um, to look into cobalt reduced um, battery overall designs with a SIN. Um, low budget manufactured electric light. Now, what I want to show you in the uh, next slide uh, is just a little summary of that. So where's the field so far in terms of design? So if you look at the full solid state battery space, um, there's been tapes made, right? And these use very high temperatures. So we bring that down to 650 and you can see here a package of about 20 micron thickness, dense and crack free um, of such a lithium garnet electrolyte. And I think this is the door opener to go to other new cell designs um, in the future, not only for full source state, but also for hybrid um, battery device architectures where you could either think about having, for instance, also a liquid component in it and just using the ceramic separator to bring in lithium and possibly um, cobalt reduced cathodes. Now, um, what I want to show here just in a nutshell, um, why I also think this is important for production later. Um, so we see here again the tape. So we are currently here. We can code, and that's what you can buy, a five by five square centimeter LZO tape. Um, that's what you can find. So LZO refers you back to the lithium garnet. And the upscaling potential, if it would be the same case like alumina, but there's far more challenges by the face nature here for lithium garnet than pure alumina you will be able to go probably in the range where you make um, cells, for instance, for electronics. It will be very tough to access um, the room and the range for battery cells in EV. What I think is quite exciting um, is that with this technique of spraying and using the sequential deposition synthesis that I showed you, there's an upscaling potential. So spraying is something that the industry knows very well, um, how to do that in various products. And just if you think about color coding, now the chemistry is of course not transferable like a color coding, but I think there could be opportunity um, over the next years uh, to go for some upscaling and potentially also access the range. So I think this is now to be seen uh, over time, how that develops, but um, I'm, I'm quite excited that um, there is some options actually ahead. Yeah, and with that, um, I just realized that I'm almost at 10.46, so Will, um, I, I'm not sure whether I have time to go in the next topic. Can you, uh, can you highlight that to me? Yeah, maybe we can um, have uh, about five more minutes. Would that be fine? Yeah. yeah. All Thanks. right, that's great. Yes, I will, I'll try to wrap it up. So I want to show you here one more example, um, which is talking more about polyamorphous um, solid electrolyte materials. So when I showed you before actually the different structures, you could actually see that um, there is the option to make crystalline cubic lithium garnet structures. However, one could also see in the Raman spectrum and other indicators that it's possible to also make amorphous phases. And fundamentally, this is really interesting um, because 
imagine you could have a solid state battery electrolyte that has no grain boundaries. So in terms of lithium dendrites, this could be very attractive um, for some depositions. And we were among the first to publish the existence of these amorphous faces um, for this lithium garnet material that you can find when you do classic synthon processing. We also found that the conductivity is very variable depending on what type of amorphous face you have and is so far undescribed in literature. Now, why is this so interesting? And I want to do here a quick analogy to Lipon. So Lipon is one of the materials which is known since 20, 30 years, um, which was like very well developed in Oak Ridge National Labs, and which shows you about 10,000 cycles of a soil state battery life. And it's in part because it's a symptom structure, it's amorphous and has no grain boundary. So it's a very interesting material to work with. So we were um, the finders of these and des described the first polyamorphous lithium garnet structures where you can have this chemistry, but you can have various amorphous states. Now, what's very different to Lipon is that Lipon is a classic Sahariyaz and glass. So you have all these different tetrahedra. So there's the little triangles you see here of a phosphor, oxygen, nitrogen, and some can form dimers. So you would just like click here with another. Um, the triangle, and then you can have the lithium actually migrate in this material and random walk. So what really fascinates me is that has been challenging to describe for 20 years, the best arrangement of these um, triangles or uh, tetrahedra actually here in the amorphous state to, to find the best lithium um, diffusion and then also like describe how to process that. So this has been quite challenging, but it has come an enormous way and shows this really high cycle numbers. So that's great. But if that has been a long way, then the question is, well, lithium garnets do not have one um, building unit. They have even up to four. So they have the lithium on an octahedral and tetrahedral side, the zirconium on an octahedral side, and you have the lanthanum oxygen also in a, a dodecahedral side in the structure. So it's really fascinated. It's go, like going to a good zoo um, and to watch this animal that becomes more complicated, like how to describe the lithium diffusion in such an amorphous structure. And what excited me a lot is there has been recent demonstrations that after our publication of the existence of the amorphous lithium garnet structures, that these were integrated actually in first cells and they show very high um, cycle stability in life. So there is a first demonstrations of 500 cycles at a C rate of um, 10. So these amorphous lithium garnet structures could be interesting protective layers later uh, for various structures um, ranging for sulfide or oxide based cells because they're also made at quite low temperatures. So they could be good protective coatings to lithium. Now, when we looked into that and we tried to understand the structures, and I want to highlight here the work of Yun Tong Ju and um, Heyman Pike and many others actually in the group, and also a good collaboration with Igor Lubomirsky at the Weizmann, Anatoly Frankel and Stony Brooks and Claire Gray um, in Cambridge. We were interested in trying to understand how we describe these amorphous phases. So as mentioned, you can make um, those packs also as being amorphous by either SDS or PLD. And when we look, for instance, on lithium NMR, what's really exciting is that depending on the post annealing temperature, so where I show it here with my cursor, we are everywhere amorphous still, we can find very different lithium hopping dynamics. And only if we crystallize to the cubic phase, um, we can actually see here that we have a classic um, like corner bonding of the bonding units. However, for the various amorphous phase, we see it's a non saharian glass because it can bond actually over the faces and edges even for the building units. And it forms, depending on which amorphous phase you are in, uh, a different condensation of the overall structure. So it's um, in some analogy, very different to Lipon, and it's another type of a non saharian glass. Now, what I want to show you here is that the impact on conductivity is striking. So you can see in orange different amorphous tailored faces that are existent for the lithium garnet in the Arrhenius diagram. And depending on what temperature you use to freeze the amorphous structure in the manufacturer, you can see here very different um, overall conductivity compared to the cubic one. So um, this is this is kind of very exciting because that correlates back to huge structure changes that we observe here. So when we look, for instance, on the conductivity um, over the post annealing temperature, then we can see that for the 
uh, various amorphous states, um, depending on how actually the building blocks are connecting, um, we can see here actually that we have different conductivities, which has a maximum around four five hundred. And I want to highlight here work from the Weizmann, from David Ehre and Igor Lubomirsky, where they showed also that in amorphous perovskite such phenomena exist. However, we have you know four local bonding block units compared to a perovskite that would only have technically one. So it's far more complicated. What we can say right now is that the lithium and the zirconium and there's exhaust and NMR evidence is acting as a network former with its building block units, where the lanternum acts like in a classic glass as a network modifier. And we can see here that with increasing annealing of the amorphous phase, we see an improved lithium local orderliness. However, it has a peak. And we can actually see here that um, it depends on how much edge and phase sharing you have of the local bonding block units for the oxygen to bridge and how the lithium is later diffusing through. So in a nutshell, what is interesting here is that this could be alternatives to LiPon um, that have actually new tailored structures. And because I made at quite low temperatures, so you can bring them down to quite low temperatures, they could either be constituents of future source state battery electrolytes um, or also be like um, protective coatings, for instance, for oxide or sulfide based um, battery designs. Okay. And with that, um, I would like to jump to the end, sorry. I'm doing a little jump here. I want to thank um, very much actually my team and my collaborators. Is there something you enjoyed in this talk? This is to all those people. And I show you here actually some pictures of the team uh, pre-COVID because they are very joyful and happy, I think. And I want to thank all of them so much for support. I particularly wish to thank all our sponsors, um, especially also here Samsung on that one uh, for all the fantastic collaboration. Uh, I want to thank you for your um, attendance and I'm open for your question in a minute. And I want to just highlight for um, a quarter minute that um, if you're also like looking for opportunities, I recently founded the Lila Material Science Mentoring Program, um, supporting um, minorities, um, females and LGBTIQ in solid state ionics. So if you're interested in having me as a mentor, you don't need to be at MIT. You can be at a company, you can be anywhere out in the world, please apply. And uh, I'm very happy to do my share and write a paper less a year, but um, also support your other careers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Jen, thank you so much for that very exciting talk. Um, I think we have now time for a few questions before we go to Elsa. So Jen, um, let's talk more about your new approach um, for the spray deposition, se uh, sequential spray deposition for the Soli electrolytes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the difference of the property of this film that you make in comparison to a traditionally processed thick film of the same dimension? Could you help us understand the difference between so yeah. you get a 10 micron traditional process versus 10 micron process your way? You already highlighted the difference in the processing conditions and the difference in the conductivity. But how about other properties like mechanical property or cell behavior, dendrite resistance? Uh, it'd be great to get some additional details. Yes, so I will try to disclose as much as I can. So first of all, there is, to the best of my knowledge, no alternative processing available to make such a 10, 20 micron film. So there is nothing out there. So in terms of wet chemical space, um, there's not really another method that can do it. The best I can compare it to is, let's say, a 60 to 100 micron thick tape, right, that, that you can process. And the lower end would be then a thin film made by LED or similar. So what's really interesting in terms of other properties to mention as you ask is that the aspect ratio of grains to the total thickness is very high. That's quite unique about these films. So you have to imagine you nucleate directly in a solid body. And because of that, you have an average 10 to five nanometer grain size. So you have a lot of grain boundary area, but your thickness can be 10 microns. So to shoot an example, if I would make a similar film, but I'm restricted to 500 nanometer or a micron in ALD or PLD, you have also 10 nanometer grains, but you have only maybe 500 nanometer of a film. So you can't stack so many grains over the thickness. If we look in tapes, you have maybe like 50 microns of average grain size, but you have a tape of 
maybe I don't know, like like 100, 300 microns, or maybe you have like 20 microns of grain size, but still your aspect ratio is very bad. So that means that you don't have many grains form going over the film thickness, which probably in terms of the mechanics is less, is at a disadvantage mm -hmm. for Sintat products. And which I think here is very interesting because you're kind of like here in the sweeter spot. Now, I can't disclose anything right now on um, the cell level testing and other performances because that is in the making. However, what I will say is um, that there are cells um, that look very promising in the cycling. All right. E, I think you have a question. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jennifer. It's a great talk here. Uh, this processing is amazing, making a very thin film right now. Um, a couple of questions actually all related, but I think I'm fascinated by this new processing you develop. Um, so the first question will be, so when, when you do a kneeling is on a substrate, then you will need to release that, right? Do you need to release that become freestanding? Uh, kind of one to 10 micron film. And, and then how, how do you do that? Because they're kind of bonded to the substrate and the kneeling temperature go up to 500, 600 degrees Celsius. Second question is um, uh, certainly, you know, ionic conductivity is still a little bit uh, further away from what you are looking for, right? So you probably want to look for 10 to minus three, at least multiple times 10 to minus four. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, this probably is a balance and uh, there are kind of conflict issues. It's other to have a high ionic conductivity, you want to have a new temperature or say, maybe even going to go close to centering temperature. So what will be the balance of that to get to the uh, high in, in our ionic conductivity? Basically two questions, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah so those are great questions. Thank you so much, Yi. So the, to come to number one, right, which was about um, how to peel it off. So I think for the best battery architecture later, you don't. You just yeah. take and choose a power support structure, which could either be an electrode or something else, but it's good in terms of weight later, reducing that, that it's not all full ceramics, but you could have a power support structure and then actually fab it on. So I showed you one example where we fab on something porous. So the idea is here not to peel it off, just have it as an integ integrationable part um, of the battery later. So you would just like leave it on as a coating, you just coat it on. To come to number two, you're correct, right? So the lithium conductivity is a little bit lower right now. Um, I ascribe said that there is still room for optimization. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's still room for optimization. However, I think it was first for us to demonstrate the new tech. I don't think you have to center to high temperatures. I don't believe it. It's more fixing maybe the total lithium concentration in the precursor. And it could also be that because you have a lot of grain boundary area, and that's a question to be answered by science, that the connectivity is a bit lower. But even then, I'm not sure I really care right now from the processing or battery standpoint, because it's not so much, and you're just so much thinner in terms of form factor. So I would like to do everything to avoid to go here to very high temperatures and avoid and ditch the centering. So, so Jennifer, for the um, you know the case you don't have to go to freestanding, right? So you have NO, you have electrolyte, cathode. Um, what will be the way to have compatibility? Because you are not going to build a multi-layer. You still need annealing. That lithium metal cannot take the annealing temperature, right? So, right. yeah. Um, it's what I'm thinking about. Maybe the reverse architecture is you make cathode first, mm -hmm. you make electrolyte, then you deposit lithium. Then that's it. And then you just, you know, roll it up. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you actually answered my question already, which is fantastic. So that is one way to do it. So it could, of course, be 10 other ways how to do it that I'm very happy to talk to you about offline. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, E. I think um, in the interest of time, we should probably move on. But Jen, I just want to make one observation. I think this idea of sequential lithiation is really a great one. And it really mirrors what is done on the cathode side for lithium ion battery. Um, you can always you know, think about when the lithium goes in as controlled by the right. kinetics. So right. I think this is something that is, um, makes a lot of sense to me. So thank you for sharing that. But yeah. we'll have time to talk to Jennifer more uh, after Elsa's talk. So uh, thank you very much, Jennifer.
So our next speaker, um, Elsa Elavetti, is here. Uh, Elsa is also a professor of material science and engineering from MIT. So we are having a MIT MSE day today. So very pleased to be hosting you both. As I mentioned earlier, um, Elsa has spent her career looking at um, the supply chain aspect, materials availability, circular economy, and technical economics related to um, many different processes. And she has made a lot of uh, uh, outstanding contributions to plastics, to catalysis, to energy storage, and other fields, and applying this uh, really comprehensive frame of analysis to have the holistic picture. In the area of batteries, she has also looked at uh, many components. Uh, for example, she has worked on the availability of cobalt and its impact, has looked at the processing of solid state batteries, and uh, she has also looked at uh, many other aspects of batteries. And these are going to be essential topics for translating new technology to market. So Elsa, we're so pleased to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the stage is yours. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I um, am, am grateful to add our, our uh, for the opportunity to add our perspectives on uh, challenges in solid state battery uh, manufacturing scaling in particular. Um, so I'm just going to share a couple stories of, of work we've done. Um, nominally two things and then and then one little idea on um at the back end here uh looking at materials availability and manufacturing scalability and and the first piece of this will be focused on solid state electrolytes but i'll broaden it uh, to lithium ion um, systems more generally um and and the space that this fits in within the work of my group that um we'll just give a great uh, overview of is looking at scalability and in, in research in particular and support of electrification towards decarbonization. Um, and in that domain, there are basically four um, spaces that we like to think about within the group, uh, how supply chains, uh, particularly material supply chains need to evolve, how we think about materials properties and what we're aiming for in terms of technical performance and how does that contribute to, to scaling more generally related to process cost, um, and then finally the overall ecosystem in which these materials operate and that gets to kind of market uh, dynamics. Um, and so I'll touch on, on on supply chains, but a little bit about kind of process and, and materials um, properties, particularly around around scaling. So that, that's the space that, that we'll cover today. Um, in, in the time I have with you all. Um, and the, the premise uh, of the work around scalability of what we're trying to do in the group, and we, you know, just beginning these efforts and always are grateful for input on this, is as researchers we're trained and we train our students to develop new technologies uh, with really the aim of optimizing this narrow set of, narrower set of performance metrics over here on the left um, uh, around you know, look, using particular materials and how that relates to technical performance um, uh, based on the set of lab-based processing equipment and, and those sorts of transport environments. But I, I feel that in order to scale at the pace that we need to, this sort of uh, unprecedented um, and overwhelming at times pace, that we have to be able to, to think about manufacturing at scale as early on as we can. Um, to try and avoid unforeseen manufacturing assembly and integration challenges that frequently arise. Um, and so this is our small attempt at, at trying to contribute to that conversation, um, but always very interested in expanding in expanding that. And so when it comes to solid state batteries, um, as you know, as I'm sure has been <laughs> been looked at throughout the day and what Jen said is as well, you know, one of the challenges is, is thinking about um, interfaces in particular um, and and how we might uh, manage interfaces better in terms of successful integration of, of solid state electrolytes into fully all solid state batteries. Um, and so in, in that, and that's just this first case that I'm going to talk about um, where we've been uh, using some methods both on the economic side, but also a little bit of, of data extraction to try to understand what are strategies that have been pursued um, to deal with solid electrolyte interface layers and um, interdiffusion at, at solid electrolyte cathode interfaces um, in, in trying to uh, improve technical performance, but then what does that, how does that represent in a manufacturing context? And what that looks like to us from this kind of very schematic perspective um, is, uh, you know, when we're thinking about the kinds of things we think about at lab scale, you know, making things in coin cell forms, um, impressed, um, and, and then what does that mean in terms of manufacturing at scale, um, where we would have different cell configurations, different methods that are used, and, and how does that, uh, 
manifest in yield and throughput, um, and in particular, uh, what the kind of my punchline on this first piece is just that we, as much as we can think about the cost and manufacturing implications of strategies that we propose to deal with interfaces, as an example, you know, the obvious statement is that technical performance needs to outweigh the associated costs or the associated uh, implications in terms of materials that we're using, et cetera. So that's kind of my, my punchline, my takeaway um, from this first part here and in, in what we've tried to think about and the methods that we've, that we've used to try to do that. So to that end, that from, from a methodology perspective, uh, what we what we do is is basically twofold. One is is looking at the the cost implications of this. So um, developing uh, techno-economic models of what scaled production as a function of a particular technology, um, you know, means, and then how do we think about uh, ways in which technology might be improved or performance might be improved and in the, in the materials and cost implications of that. Uh, and so for this work, which was recently um, published in, in Juul, we looked at oxide and sulfide based uh, solid state batteries um, and the you just see the example process uh, steps on the left. Um, where we've just looked at, you know, what the manufacturing context would look like, what the steps are required, and the associated materials uh, with that. Again, just looking at an oxide and sulfide-based chemistries as examples, and we have, you know, a little bit more resolution um, among the oxide and sulfide families, which I'm just illustrating um, on the right-hand side here. We end up with this baseline cost, and the total cost um, numbers are are not the point here, um, but just. To, to give you a sense of, you know, that the, the, we do have those numbers, but really what we're interested in is how those change as a function of these different strategies that might be pursued to address um, interfacial issues. Uh, and, and just to explain these plots on the right hand side a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail, we're just looking at total cost in, in dollars per kilowatt hour as a function of different um, oxide and uh, sulfide based chemistries that we're looking at um, and then just broken down by cost component where the materials cost um, is dominant as one might expect um, and on the right hand side for the oxide based system we just looked uh, a little bit comparing, you know, if they if the trying to normalize by density differences between the oxide and sulfide based systems and and capacity based differences. So so those details are a little bit beyond the scope of 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 what we were um, of the point that I want to make with you all this morning here. Um, but just just to explain what's going on there. But this being driven by materials cost um, is is not unexpected, um, but also drives the ways in which we pursue the um, analysis beyond this point. So that's that's uh, the, the baseline for the economic analysis that we're doing. And then that we couple with um, the, a text mining analysis that we did in collaboration with, with Jen, um, looking at extracting not only the process conditions within the literature, um, so what you're seeing on the left here as a function of uh, the chemistries that have been pursued in the, in the literature, um, a different sulfide and, and the LZO uh, chemistries as a function of the temperatures used in this in the synthesis um, that we that we have extracted automatically using the pipeline that we've developed within the group to do so through natural language processing um, to try to summarize what are the recipes that are used that then feeds into that economic model that I just showed you right if we know the steps and the temperatures at which they are occurring then we can begin to estimate the scaling of those um, as a function of, of things like production volume and how that contributes to yield, um, as well as the um, uh, interfacial strategies that have been pursued. So this is just giving you a, a quick example of a basic um, uh, set of extractions that we've done here. Um, and where what you're, what you're seeing is as a function of chemistry, uh, the highest frequency temperature, reported temperature for, for a heating step um, within this. And just again, as an example, we can break down the LLZO um, uh, process flows by the temperature and heating step that that temperature was applied. Uh, so we're showing here um, on the right hand side the um, uh, LZO broken down by sintering step, annealing, calcination, and drying, and you can just see the evolution of that. Um, and then also, what's interesting is to is to to dig into the uh, range of, of temperatures that are that are used and and go into I'm sure some of the things that that Jen talked about I apologize uh, for missing the details there so the baseline economic analysis coupled with 
details on the, the literature, details within the literature on the processing conditions, we can pull out very quickly, couple that with other chemistry um, approaches that are adopted uh, in order to try to get at how were temperature reductions achieved um, without sacrificing performance in processing temperature. And I'm sure, again, Jen, Jen talked about this um, as well. So here on the left, we're looking at processing temperature um, as a function of, of dopant, essentially, so um, where that's uh, modeled as a variation from uh, LLZO, LLZO molecular weight, right? We would expect a relationship between variation and molecular weight um, based on based on the degree of doping and, and how that would be pursued and then try to correlate that with processing temperature. So here just trying to give you a little bit of example of how we leverage the what's in the literature to extract out ranges in processing temperature, ranges in chemistry um, that are that are that are pursued. And then also on top of that, different uh, approaches that are used to to address interfaces such as um, adding interfacial layers, uh, changing uh, slurry chemistries, et cetera. And so all that information feeds together in, in a set of analyses um, that I'm just going to show you two examples of around use of text mining to learn processing conditions to then translate that to economics, to try to inform some questions around potential scaling implications as early on as we can um, in, the, in, the, in the pursuit of these strategies within the, within the literature and within the research um, community. And here, as I said um, already, my punchline is um, that we would want to, to quantify as early as possible where performance gains are able to outweigh costs of implementation. Uh, and so I just picked two examples um, here, combining the techno-economic work I said with the, with the data mining to, to look at what, what are the potential um, scaled implications of, of strategies that have been pursued. And I'm comparing uh, two different strategies here that have been pursued to address interfacial issues and the particular recipes associated with those strategies. Um, so in the first example on the left hand side, there's a sputtered tin layer that to help with interfacial resistance performance that we see the baseline cost in blue there where we don't have the added tin um, with performance increase of about 60 million hours per gram as reported. Um, but in this case, the cost of the um, deposit layer is sort of has equivalent cost um, in, in that outweigh essentially the, the performance gains. Um, so that's the left hand side where we're sort of our green that's shown as the as the improvements in performance, lowering the dollars per kilowatt hour, um, but then as a trade off associated with increased costs associated with tuttering, sputtering the tin. And obviously the performance at scale, you know, we don't have the direct measurement of and the and we have we have modeled what the what the tin sputtering um, would cost at scale. But just this idea that that there is maybe a challenge in having those performance gains um, outweigh the cost of implementation is a flag for us to think more thoroughly about in the design of that particular research or that or pursuit of that particular direction. And that is comparison on the right hand side, um, where I get, this is a different chemistry, obviously, but the but the example here, um, what the what the strategy was, was an optimization of the slurry management of the slurry chemistry and, and an addition of more binder that saw a significant increase um, in performance as shown by the, the green um, directionality there at, at not so much added cost, um, system cost, when we think about that in the context of the model. So in this case, um, you know, we would see that potentially that that strategy, the optimization of slurry chemistry as an example, um, if we can see these sorts of performance gains, um, may be a more cost effective strategy. So again, not to say that these are the costs or this, you know, that, 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 that this is the sort of a strategy to be endorsed, but just this ability, this sort of demonstration of these tools to try to inform manufacturing costs at scale um, was, was what I wanted to share with you all here. Um, and then, so the, the second story I wanted to share has to do with ha going back to my initial um, framework that I talked about in terms of considering scalability in research. What I just talked about sort of overlaps this materials and process cost idea. Um, but the other thing that we like to think uh, a lot about is, is supply chains. This is sort of, uh, excuse me, materials availability uh, related to um, uh, rapid scaling effectively, deployment um, in terms of support of, of electrification and the scale at which that needs to occur. Um, so I'll just uh, use the second part of my time here to, to tell you a little bit of that story. Um, and in that case, uh, the, my punchline again to, um, uh, to scoop myself is that um, 
it's not about running out. I'm sure folks are very familiar with the, the sort of, you know, cycles of hype in the, in the popular press about, oh, we don't have enough X, we don't have enough Y. Um, for us, it's about trying to identify what is it about a particular materials market or how it's used in a, in a, in a, in a manufacturing or, you know, towards the science um, perspective, what's needed in terms of the purity or nature of a material. How does that contribute to potential supply chain disruptions? Um, and th that's important for rapid deployment as folks could intuit, um, because if we, you know, if the supply chains are in, you know, disrupted or, or even perceived disruption in supply, um, that can Im impact the ability to deploy, impact people's interests, market adoption, companies' uh, risk effectively, the risk being deemed too high by a decision maker in order to pursue that strategy. Uh, and that can be a function of many things, the market imperfections, how substitutable a particular material is, the nature of how it's mined, et cetera. Um, and just to drive the point home a little bit, Further, the reason why we particularly um, like to think about this issue, in addition to the supply chain disruptions, is that um, you know the the implications that that has on on price, on cost, um, can again discourage technology adoption. Um, at the pace at which it needs to occur. And so in the right hand side here, um, this is some work done by Yet Ming Chang and, and Bill Green at MIT, looking at learning curves associated with battery manufacturing capabilities. Um, as those decrease, as shown in the top line here, we start to, to uh, asymptote towards um, the uh, materials costs, and so we become more um, subject or more sensitive to volatility in the in in the price of materials. And so we've done a lot of work to understand what are the factors that drive price increase, um, uh, and and therefore could influence the cost of a technology and its ability to scale. Um, and so the uh, um, point that um, I want to make here is is kind of a couple fold is that we look at a set of kind of screening metrics associated with materials availability. Um, oh, I skipped a slide. That's the problem. Um, and as folks know, you know, we have to get specific then about what we mean by a particular chemistry. And as I said, my first example was focused on solid state electrolytes. When I talked about the manufacturing scalability here, I'm broadening to materials generally um, within lithium ion chemistries, and in particular, looking at some, uh, you know, lithium, cobalt, nickel, and then I'll show some, some uh, metrics around uh, manganese, et cetera, as we go through. And as we know, we need to think about what chemistries we mean, because as a function of what chemistry is going to um, uh, mean different things in terms of materials intensity, this audience knows that um, in spades. Um, and so for each of these elements, I'm not implying, obviously, it's used in its metallic form, but um, just to, uh, it's easier to, to talk about the data in that way. Um, in the case of lithium across the just even NMC chemistry is lots of uniform or, you know, the, the total quantity materials intensity is similar um, versus when we start to think about cobalt nickel and there's much, um, you know, broader range even within the NMC, uh, NMC family. Um, and so the, the, in terms of our methodology, in terms of the research that we pursue, uh, the idea is to look at some basic screening metrics to get a sense of which materials might we need to dig into in more detail. Um, and so I'll just uh, make a couple of points, um, just again, to illustrate our approach, um, but then also try to draw out some conclusions uh, based on that. So what I'm showing on this slide um, is in two plots, the same information. Um, on the x-axis is fraction in top country, meaning how concentrated a particular supply chain is um, it, geographically, versus the what's called static depletion index on the y-axis, um, which is the, the reserves, the economically ex uh, extractable um, quantity of a particular material divided by the annual production. So this idea of how many years at current um, economically extractable um, um, content would we have material. And the, the point is about the contrast between the two. On the left hand side, you see a much narrower axis in both the X and the Y for things that are mature elements, nickel and manganese dominated by their use in steel, not a lot of movement in these metrics. Excuse me, I forgot to tell you one critical thing, which is that the each of the points that I'm showing here are five year increments from 2005, 2010, um, 15 and 20. Obviously, these numbers change over time, both, um, both numbers in the numerator and the denominator of the x-axis, y-axis change over time. And so for nickel and manganese, there's not a lot of movement um, if you account for the, the more narrow axes um, 
a more narrow scale compared to on the right hand side, um, looking at lithium and cobalt again as, as contrasting examples, where over the course of my five year increments, lots of, of movement in these dots, um, uh, where we're finding more, where we're, you know, the, the nature of extraction is changing. Um, and, the, and the point of concern in particular, as folks know, because it's been oft talked about in the literature and in the popular press is cobalt, that has both become over the past, um, uh, since 2005 has both become much more concentrated um, in geographically, but also that we are not finding material at the rate at which we are at, at an increased rate relative to the rate we are extracting such that the number on the y axis is also going down. So what these provide for us is is a screening um, for where there may be um, materials of, of more concern to, to understand in more detail. Um, and uh, you know, another way to think about this visually is just to, to think about the geographic distribution of these materials where I'm then now comparing just cobalt on the left in terms of trade flow in million US dollars, where export is shown in red, import in green um, on the left hand side for cobalt and on the right hand side for, for lithium. And the and the contrast is, is very visually apparent, um, the degree of concentration for cobalt um, uh, geographically versus lithium and cobalt being concentrated not only in mining, but also in refining. Um, whereas the lithium supply chain much more diversified and as folks know also more diversified in terms of how we mine it from both brine and rock so just again screening the other concern i'm sure as folks know is for cobalt is the byproduct nature of the of the extraction um, that that cobalt is mined as a byproduct um, of other carrier metals uh, copper and nickel principally and so that's another flag for us uh, in terms of, of where there may be concerns, supply chain concerns that could lead to more volatility in, in price. Um, and the right hand side, I'm just showing this framework that we've used to kind of evaluate this byproduct challenge um, in a more comprehensive way across energy materials. And I'm happy to take that and uh, talk about this more in, in questions, which I'm hoping to leave a couple minutes for um, here at the end, but I won't focus on it um, more now. So those are some metrics on the on the supply side. Um, the other interesting point that we've looked at on the demand side gets to this degree of deployment um, issue in particular around scaling of, you know, sort of how how scale do we need to get in order for or the, the how much production needs to change as a function of the of the pace of deployment um, and, and the potential for resource constraints, even where we wouldn't expect it. Um, because of that growth trajectory. And here I'm comparing lithium, cobalt, and nickel. And as folks know, you know, other chemistries become of more interest in, in looking at manganese or iron phosphates. And I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, but what I'm what I'm showing here for lithium, cobalt, and nickel is the is the historic compound annual growth rate. Um, it, you know, sort of how these materials have, have grown in the past in terms of fraction relative to certain amounts of deployment, so five terawatt hours um, in 2030 um, versus 100 terawatt hours in, in 2050. Um, for each of these um, elements in, in comparison to the historic. And what I'll just particularly highlight um, is the significant um, compound annual growth rate required for nickel um, for, um, and this is for a set of chemistries, um, NMC based chemistries effectively um, through 2050 um, for 100 terawatt hours. So this is thinking about both vehicle and grid based deployment potentially that this 15% growth rate required is far above the historic um, CAGR. And then the other nuance that folks um, may be aware of associated associated with, with nickel is that the vast majority of, of nickel as currently extracted is not relevant for the, for the EV market um, because it's extracted for, for steel application and a ferro nickel. Um, and so being dominated and even uh, growth in nickel has been dominated by expansion of nickel pig iron for stainless steel or ferro nickel um, with fewer ore discoveries that would lead to battery grade nickel. Um, and so I think that the the implications there are interesting to consider in the in the nuance around that we don't mean running out we mean the sort of change in the nature of the supply um, of that material and 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 what that means for the supply chains um, that that is interesting um, and uh, so so nickel is particularly of concern there versus something like lithium and what I'm showing on the bottom here is over time um, lithium's 
the dynamics associated with the end use for lithium use in batteries. Um, and the, this blue line here is showing that end use increasing, um, you know, to significant fractions such that those supply chains have become, or the, the mining supply chains have become more used to um, that, that market as an end use for extraction. Actually, I think there was just an article in the New York Times um, this morning, maybe, or yesterday about uh, lithium growth domestically, um, which, was, which was interesting as well. Um, so I'm, I'm headed towards the end of my time here, and I just wanted to, to bring this, oh, oh, how funny, there we go, um, bring this back a little bit, actually, to my interfacial um, point um, around uh, solid state electrolytes. And we did a similar analysis looking at a couple of strategies um, that had been pursued for, for interfacial mitiga uh, resistance mitigation um, in solid state electrolytes, looking particularly at germanium, um, tannin, and lanthanum as, as kind of going through that screening analysis that I just gave you some metrics around um, the elements that popped out for further consideration related to solid state electrolytes more broadly. Um, and so the, the point being here um, is that the uh, tantalum raised some concerns for us in terms of the, um, you can see the, the blue dotted line here, Sorry, I didn't explain the plot. So the, this has the x-axis has to do with deployment in terms of terawatt hours um, in in 2030 for solid state battery production versus that compound annual growth rate that I that I talked about before. Um, and the and the blue dashed vertical line here corresponds to reserves for tantalum in, in 2018. Um, and then these little uh, stripes here are the uh, caggers, the historic caggers for for germanium and tantalum in particular, um, and so tantalum was a flag is a flag for us in terms of scaling along two dimensions. One, the sort of resource, uh, the um, reserve limit uh, for and the degree of um, uh, has changed from historic deployment. As well as on the right hand side, tantalum is also extracted as a byproduct um, material, the, similar to the way cobalt is. In tantalum's case, it's from niobium um, and tin. And so, what I'm plotting over time here is, is tantalum production relative to the potential for added tantalum capacity relative to extraction of, of niobium and, and tin. And we see that this, the num, you know, the, this is sort of like the, the buffer, the production buffer associated with, with tantalum relative to these other elements. And we see that the, um, you know, as you com compare to germanium, which is, you know, log scale here, that there were very, very much below the, the buffer for current germanium production. It's not so true um, for tantalum. And so again, just the sorts of screening metrics that, that give us pause and, and mean we want to dig into these and more for, dig into this in more, for, in more detail to understand how cost implications might arise. Um, so I will end there uh, to make the point that to reinforce the point I made before about this gains in technical performance must outweigh intended materials and manufacturing costs. And as early as we can understand that as possible might help to uh, refine and inform the, the research directions that we pursue. Um, and then I just have a couple points here on these materials availability. Lithium, as is often reported, um, you know, has been able to be responsive to these increases in demands. Whereas cobalt and nickel, there's some nuances in those supply chains that mean we want to be thinking about other chemistries that will help to diversify that, that challenge. Um, so with that, I'll say uh, thanks for this opportunity, and I'm happy to take a question or two before I have to log off. Thanks so much. Elsa, thank you so much. I know uh, you have a busy day today, so thanks for making the time. Maybe I will just uh, take a, a very quick question here. Um, so on the slide that you showed the cost distribution for conventional solid state batteries, I think you had the material cost at about 90%, this is quite extraordinary. Is this pointing to um, the low cost of the processing or the high cost of the raw materials? Um, in this case, it's it's more the uh, I guess high cost of materials, or just that that the materials cost is what dominates um, you know kind of any gains in 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 that we're able to make in terms of reduction materials or um, or scaled material production effectively. I mean, that's a lot of times what happens in these newer technologies is it or evolving chemistries is that the the ability to make those materials in bulk at scale is, you know, there's a learning curve associated with that. Um, and so that's actually, you know, something that we that we're digging into now is is the and, you know, it's linked to my rapid deployment point, right? As, you know, depending on the trajectory of what we're, it, it's good to have these time horizons in mind as we're developing these technologies, because that would, that would point to that. So it's more driven by, um, 
the the it's it's more driven by the materials cost, but that I you know I think that they're very much linked, right? The the ways in which we improve this is the point I wanted, the ways in which we are able to improve yield through improved production, you know, to the points that that I'm sure Jen was making earlier on, then that just automatically drives cost down. Sure, and I think it also assumes quite a thick um, uh, membrane, for example, uh, for the cost you're projecting. So certainly making it thinner would decrease the cost. Of course. So, uh, that's uh, that's very nice to hear given the two talks today. <laughs> so, and then I, I know your time is very limited. So I want to thank you again for joining. And um, and now uh, we're going to have a discussion uh, with with Jennifer. It was awesome to see the two um, Rock Scar faculty from MIT present back to back on a similar topic. So this really highlights, I think, um, the depth of the bench um, at, at MIT and the stars of the players. I'm, I really was very happy to see that. Um, so now we have a few moments to talk more broadly. Right. And I thought I will start, uh, Jen, by asking you this question about scaling up. Can you tell us a bit about where we are in scaling up solid state batteries, specifically the solid electrolyte? And where do you think a big gain can be made in terms of the scaling up itself? Not about the chemistry uh, specifically, but just about where we are and where do we need to go for scaling up? Right. Um, so that's a great question, Will. So my understanding is from listening to some of my contacts in the car manufacturing industry for EV in particular, right? If we if we want to bring it to a cell with 10 by 30 square centimeter, that's a lot of coking for a solid state battery electrolyte. And if we think about it, and I apologize for that, Will, to be for a moment technical, if we think about what it means in terms of homogeneity, and in controlling shrinkage and in controlling how well we can manufacture things, for instance, from a powder, I think for a tape, it, I, I do see perspective, but it needs the best ceramicists, right? And how working with ceramic industry to go from something that is, I think, manufacturer like five by five square centimeter of a tape to 10 by 30. And my example is that for alumina, it took them decades of development to get it to 20 by 20. And alumina by phase is far more easily made. So let's say your shrinkage is far less than compared to lithium garnet, just as an example. So this is the challenge I think we face in manufacturing. And then as Elsa also mentioned, um, to be compatible in price, we sh my personal suggestion is to really look into what are alternatives to not manufacture from powders for scale up, but rather directly from liquid chemistry into solidification, which saves you one process step, is good on costs. And also I think encoding it on could be a game changer in terms of scaling this up and move completely away from any vacuum tech. I, I don't think if, if the production volume, volume later is so high as anticipated, um, it, it's gonna be challenging, I think, yeah. But as I see great. these different routes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely good. I think uh, for especially, uh, battery electric vehicle applications, I think the vacuum route um, is going to be uh, cost controlling, I think at the end, but perhaps for specialty applications, that will be reasonable. But let me take you, um, ask you a further question. So you highlighted this problem with the area, right? Uh, yeah. That really making a large area. A am I correct to understand that's the path toward lowering the cost production is to scale up the production area? Or are you thinking more about the size of the cell that could be made in terms of the requirements on area? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to differentiate that. I think area is later going to define whether it's gonna be an application like Razor Electronics or a drone, mm -hmm. because there you need like significantly lower area, right? You can also work with other cost factors or whether it's gonna be EV. And I think for EV, it's gonna be large. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can be that some ceramic tech will make it easily into the electronic space, but it's more challenging to scale up and mm -hmm. will outrule some methods um, for EV. Now, the other part of the question I think that you had was on costs. And what, what I do believe is I think in terms of costs, if you can, I think if you can find any method where you don't have to go 
to a manufacturer get the powder, densify, go to very high temperature, also in terms of making the cathode on, right? So you have to co-center that. You have to get a mechanical good bond. And I think the only way, and I stick to that, to bring in cobalt reduced cathodes is to walk away from, from classic co-sintering. So it's not like a fuel cell. So battery is very different here. And in order to do that trick, I think it, it could be that run route is to, um, to just not traditionally process from, from powders and then classic sintering, yeah. Yeah, absolutely agree. That will affect the costs, I think, very much. So I think it's two separate things on area and cost bracket. Yeah. yeah. No, I think they're highly related. And, you know, one thing that really occurred to me is, uh, you know, although you didn't show any pictures of your uh, photos of your setup, I can imagine it's very inexpensive to have um, the spray uh, deposition setup compared to a very precise uh, temperature control kiln. Do I have the correct understanding there that the capex for production uh, is also going to be crucial as well in driving the cost. Yes, so currently it's not. So in my analysis that we published, it's 75% of the total costs will be given by which production route you take. And I think it's very clear, right? If you, if you have to go to a manufacturer like BSF or someone and get the powder, then apply pressure densification, um, center very high up. There's many processing steps that you have to execute that are quite expensive. Then the problem is like many of the best lithium conductors are those structures that a small change in any stoichiometry and locally just on, let's think about a tape, right? Can lead to small to challenges in controlling shrinkage, um, warping. Warping is a big challenge if you scale up, yeah? So these factors don't scale linearly. And I think one idea here is by taking the center element out and taking a powder to densification route out, but coming from nucleation and decomposition reactions, that it would allow you later to, for instance, code wider areas. You're more independent of the substrate. Also, maybe in terms of weights, that's interesting because isn't it better to have um, a right porous structure in which you coat maybe 10 microns instead of having a thick, dense, warpable tape, right? So that's also good for the battery, I think, overall. And being here, I think, at a, at a lower temperature budget um, is, is very significant. And I think this, this should be able to upscale, but we haven't done it yet. It's early days. We just disclosed this new opportunity in processing, and I think this is still to be shown. Yeah. But I, I see a lot of perspective, yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think in addition to the absolute temperature, right, which also sets the thermal budget for your process, I think the requirement for temperature uniformity, if I'm not mistaken, is exactly. probably going to be more crucial at the high temperature. So I think my impression is that for high temperature centering and processing of films, of thick films, uh, it's going to be very demanding on the equipment themselves, which I think will also uh, dictate the cost, if I'm not mistaken. Would you agree with that? I agree with that fully, yes. And I think, again, there's a big difference whether, so you could argue, well, um, there's maybe like production volume of 10,000 fuel cells a year or something, but we're going here in a billion or something for, for batteries. So it's a very different production volume. But even if you anticipate that, you can't change face, nature, and chemistry. And many of the lithium conductors are having significant more challenges to face stabilize over wider areas. Um, so, so it's a different game, I would say. Absolutely, absolutely. And maybe let me ask one more sort of detailed question before we zoomed out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So on the scale up, mm -hmm. have you considered throughput? Mm -hmm. and, and how important is throughput in this case in determining the cost? Do, do you see... Um, an advantage um, for a process that could, for example, maybe Elsa was making this point, maybe the performance or quality is not as good, but the throughput is very high. So thereby giving you the proper trade-offs. Uh, you know, I think certainly as scientists and engineers ourselves would like to make the best possible material, but economically, uh, there's always a trade-off. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what you see as the potential trade-offs between cost and performance and processing and where would the sweet spot lie? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think in in terms of throughput, I 
if it's about me, so I'm not sure whether it's so significant, whether you're exactly 10 over minus four, 10 over minus five Siemens per centimeter, as long as you're very thin and you have, for instance, lithium on the other side. In terms of throughput, it could mean that local variations at low temperature process uh, in, in you know, slight structure changes are not as relevant as at high center temperatures, but may allow you to deposit more quickly. Also, we have to consider, even though in terms of throughput, right? If you think about it, like in traditional ceramic processing, you have to densify. So that's one step you can't take away per, per piece. So your throughput is limited by that with, to, to do that. And then later you can maybe like, and there's great um, work from Liang Bing Hu and others from the Maryland for sure you can in some seconds actually bring it on very high temperature. But then still in terms of throughput, you have to co-center a cathode. So if I can take away the co-centering and some of the densification up there, I think in throughput that may be more competitive um, to design other process lines later to take it. And, and I think later in throughput, one could imagine to have like a roll where it just goes through and you have like various sprays arranged, right? Um, that could be quicker to count than to densify from powder. And there's different like products where that is done, right? So there is a likelihood, but now we have to also be realistic that coating a car color with some spray is a different um, dimension than coating, for instance, a ceramic, yeah. And it's unclear for now, for instance, how much do thickness variations play a role? Um, is there other like chemical compatibilities with other components? I think that's like still, it's very early days, yeah. Thank you, Jen. Um, so maybe zooming out a little bit, mm -hmm. I always like to draw analogy between different fields. And I know you are a very well positioned to do so, having done quite a number of things uh, tied together by ceramics. You know, in this area of thin uh, electrolyte for solid state battery, where do you see an analogous field which has achieved the necessary success in the scale? Um, or is it something completely new that it is really, there's no example to look to uh, elsewhere in ceramics? That's a fantastic question. Um, looking at the specs, right? So it's orders of magnitude away from, for instance, fuel cells or super caps or other tech, where I think there is a field up and rising in ceramics as sensors. So there's like more and more need for sensors, for instance, where you would also use more similar tech, I think, to this, right? But still, it will never be at the numbers. If we think about 2030 and having 30% electrified cars driving, right? The production volume is huge. Now, the question is like, how competitive will solid state batteries be by then or hybrids? And how much will be, you know, replaced in that share, right? So I think it's an unprecedented case for ceramic industry. And also, it's and that's my point, right? In terms of material and phase, it's unprecedented because many of the other ceramics have lower numbers, but then maybe complex chemistry. I mean, alumina, for instance, right? Would be, or zirconium oxide would be one of the most produced ceramics that are around, but they are not, uh, in most cases, electrochemically functional ceramics in their use case. Mm -hmm. So this is really new. And that is why I think it is very relevant for the field to not sleep and do great fundamental research, but collaborate with industry to find a way to make a high volume of these functional electrochemical ceramics. I think it's unprecedented. So I love your question. Well, uh, unprecedented requires innovation. So this is great, great problem indeed. So Jen, normally uh, we don't take any more Q and A's at this point. Mm -hmm. However, um, two of our esteemed colleagues have questions for you. So I thought I would just uh, take the final few minutes to ask them on their behalf. Uh, so Stan Whittingham uh, has a question. So do you think that the electrolyte can be used at slightly elevated temperatures, say about 100 degrees C to improve performance? Any, any challenges in raising the cell temperature? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Stan. So thank you so much also for attending the talk. Um, so I do believe that you can operate them at higher temperatures. So once we manufacture that at about 
400, then, you know, dissociate the uh, silicium salt, um, go to crystallize at 650, then the structure is stable. So it should not be a problem to be about four or 500 degrees lower in operation. And as a rule of thumb in ceramics, so you normally free, you kind of like stabilize the structure at about one, 200 degrees higher. So having a gap here of four or 500 should not be a problem on long-term stability because diffusion is not as activated anymore at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, his second question is, can the interface between the cathode and the electrolyte when use uh, this uh, processing route, is it possible to eliminate the use of um, a liquid as an interfacial layer? That is a great question. Um, so it is possible to directly spray bilayers of a cathode electrolyte. So we have one example, but we have to do more in the electrochemical testing to say the truth. Um, I, I think potentially it could be um, because the microstructure is like really these five, 10 nanometer grains over 10 microns, it's razor dense. But now I think later for production, when we have to run helium uh, leakage tests, do some standard tests to also confirm, you know, for so and so many 100 cycles running with the liquid will still be stable. But I think there is option to engineer that without a liquid by playing now here very carefully with interface engineering and the design of the cathode. But I think this is, to be honest, another two to three years of research of my life to look into cathodes here, but it is on my to-do list. And I am planning so uh, to develop actually these chemistries uh, with the SDS technique here in the, in the next years. Up and coming, great question. Excellent, excellent, Jen. Thank you, Stan, for the great question. And I also have another question from Linda Nazar. Um, who would like to ask about the advantages of amorphous LLZO. Um, mm -hmm. So she highlights, of course, uh, it has been shown the dendra issue can be a problem even in single crystal. Uh, so she would like to understand the advantage of uh, amorphous LLZO beyond um, the lowering the temperature of processing. Yeah, thank you so much for the great question, Linda. So that's a good one. Right, so what was shown in single crystal experiments by the colleagues were that wherever you have a defect, you're prone to form a lithium dendrite. However, now we have to think about what's a realistic scenario in a cell and there you won't have a single crystal, um, you know, very bad to manufacture. You would have something with grain boundary and grain microstructure. So where the lithium dendrites really go first and, and predominance in many of the lithium oxide based materials is along the grain boundary um, in, in forming the dendrite. So by having now an amorphous structure, that's probably why Lipon works so well, um, that is also stable to its lithium. This could be interesting um, to just, you know, code a little bit as a buffer layer. And one thing that I will highlight here is the amorphous films, we can make them at 3 to 100 degrees C. So this is suddenly close to where you make sulfides. So technically, it could become an interesting protective layer to bring on sulfide cells, for instance, for lithium to avoid mitigation. Or it could be a small layer you just bring in by nature and process after having fat, for instance, the solid state battery electrolyte core uh, of silicium oxide based materials. So, but there we have first TM data where we see it's stable with silicium for the amorphous phases, but now we have to do more electrochemical investigations um, and also highlight. And it's a three, four year project with Claire and, and some other colleagues where we try in three, four years to write a paper on what are these amorphous structures of lithium garnets. So um, give me another half year and I hope we have finished then and really understood and can publish what they are actually. So that's to be resolved first. Well, thank you, Jen. We certainly hope to have you back very soon uh, to speak. And uh, Linda, thank you very much for your question. So I think this brings us to the conclusion of the symposium. But Jen, I was wondering if you have any words of wisdom for our viewers, especially students and postdoc who are just beginning uh, their training and their professional career. Oh, that's a great one. Um, yeah. So first of all, what I want to encourage you, you can do more than vote green. You have all this amazing brain power. So don't waste any minute and think about the toughest problems we have in the field and do those. So I would love, love you to encourage your supervisor and really challenge them and asking yourself every day when you walk to the lab um, or do computer science, is that really one of the toughest problems that is right now existence? The risk for failure is high, but be courageous, be brave. You're allowed to do so. 
And, um, and I think this is what we need as a field to strive, right? And, and, and really make it forward. And we have here an option to change things for society. So by doing good chemistry. Um, so I, I hope this motivates you. And uh, I look personally forward to see all successes of, of the next generation coming for sure. Thank you, Jen. It certainly motivates me. So this is great. And Jen, thank you very much again. And I also like to add my thanks for Elsa for joining us. Uh, it was truly wonderful to spend two hours talking about scaling up and uh, supply chain for solid state batteries. Uh, so I'm also uh, pleased to announce um, the rest of the schedule uh, for this spring quarter. So in two weeks, uh, we're going to have a wonderful panel discussion on the connect the intersection of energy storage and building energy efficiency. Uh, and we're going to have um, a really uh, outstanding uh, scholar and practitioner um, to speak to us on May 21st. And on June 4th, uh, we're going to have uh, Frank Blom, who was the head of the battery business at Volkswagen, who will discuss um, the latest strategies there. And then finally, on June 18th, uh, we will have a deep dive on battery cathode chemistry with Professor Yang Kuk Sun at Hanyang University and Hooper Gastiager at the Technical University of Munich. So just a reminder, uh, we do a lot of our um, uh, information sharing on our LinkedIn page. So if you're interested, please uh, join and follow us on LinkedIn. And I also want to mention uh, for those of you who are interested in learning about uh, energy technology and the energy transition, Stanford offers numerous online courses that you can find by going to online.stanford.edu. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone again for joining and have a wonderful weekend.